This isn't Grover's Corners, nor is it a play by Thornton Wilder. My high school, now yellowed, paperback copy of that play included a preface that read, this is not a picture of life, nor is it a speculation on the conditions of life, but rather it is an attempt to find value for the smallest events of our daily life. In this case, with our town, we're talking about Cambridge during the pandemic. Like Wilder's, our play seeks to find value in the events of daily life. But moreover, it's about how we feel about what happened to us during that time. Uh, regarding the staging of Wilder's play and this one, Wilder wrote, there is no curtain, no scenery. The stage is empty and in half light. Uh, our play takes place between March 15th and September 15th, 2020, not in 1901 or 1903 or 1913, as in Wilder's play. It's a look at what happened to and was experienced by the people who live and work in Cambridge. The script is in their words. It also reports on what happened during that time and does so using excerpts from newspapers and other source materials. It is, if you will, a snapshot of life during an unprecedented time, the time of the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, the pandemic. Not everyone made it through, and for many who did, they will be forever changed. What we knew of as normal is no more. Some people talk about a, a new normal, but really, what does that mean? Now, you won't hear a rooster crowing to open our play, but let's begin. My husband died Tuesday, March 17th, just as the pandemic was hitting Boston. Michael and I were a couple since 1978, but we didn't live together until 2005 when he bought our place just outside of Inman Square, near where I grew up. We were married at the Cheryl House, it's a skilled nursing facility. He had gotten very ill with diabetes and we were surrounded by 10 of our closest family and friends. We told everyone the big wedding party would be soon. The wedding rings we were looking at were never even bought. I got a call the morning after his 71st birthday. When I called back, I couldn't reach him. I got a nurse to get him on the phone and he did not sound good. Immediately I suspected a stroke and I was off to St. Elizabeth's Medical Center. He was there for a week and could have no visitors. While he was in the hospital, he was given many tests and he experienced symptoms of what I now know to be COVID-19. The test administered to him two days before he died came back negative at the end of the week, but I doubt its veracity. Our final goodbye. Michael's on a gurney and the nurse turns him around in order to view me. She told him I blew him a kiss. He raised his arm and gestured with his hand and blew one back. At the time when we as humans need solace more than ever, I mourned and grieved in silence and isolation. Family and friends keep up with me, but I need to be around people. And I'll plan a memorial celebration as soon as it's safe. About the new coronavirus, its survival on surfaces is similar to that of the SARS virus. They're related. On plastic, after eight hours, only 10% remained, but it wasn't undetectable until 72 hours after. Stainless steel, undetectable after 48 hours. Cardboard, 48 hours, according to the New England Journal of Medicine. It all started with my neighbor, Jeff. I sometimes left him Tupperware with a meal in front of his apartment door. With the current situation of COVID-19, it puts all of us humans in a very unusual situation. 
Now we are told that we should stay at home and stay healthy and safe. Since we all do have to eat at some point during the day, I wanted to help by sharing some of my cooking ideas, since I love to cook. My idea of dinner with my neighbor is based on the fact that we can still be social, even during these difficult times. It's an idea of making food for at least one neighbor or friend and then eat it together via FaceTime or Skype. In olden times, they say sailors would use the ragged end of a piece of rope dipped in salt water. Rural folk went for corn cobs, which they hung up in the outhouses they used. There were other items used, such as newspapers, uh, catalogs, the pages of books, until the invention of commercial toilet paper in 1857. Toilet paper is currently in short supply. I had to brave the elements yesterday with my kids. We gathered materials we had and made, including no sew, multi-layered face protection with disposable, activated charcoal paper towels, toilet paper pouches for the inner filter layer, washable, non-woven fabric, reusable shopping bag material for the filter pack cover, washable, reusable cotton bandanas, hold and wrap filter pack around the nose and mouth, covering the bottom of the face and chin, and tied securely around the head and neck. And then I added a few drops of tea tree oil into the fabric and rubbed it in. We also brought a small pocket-sized bottle of bleach water to spray the handles and pin pads and, um, yeah, gloved hands while outside. Hi, my name is Theodora Skiatis, and I am the executive director of Cambridge Local First. Cambridge Local First is a nonprofit network of 400 plus local and independent businesses here in Cambridge. Our mission is to support, promote, and celebrate a local economy community by educating the public and government about the significant environmental, economic, and cultural benefits of a strong local economy. We are in a network of independent business associations around the country working to amplify local economies. We are in dire times for our local businesses, which constitute the bedrock of our economy. Many are closing, and some estimates suggest that 40% of our local businesses will fail to reopen following the crisis. Entrepreneurship in general has been declining for decades. Our local businesses have displayed incredible resilience, innovation, and malleability amidst these challenging times. They have had to reinvent themselves, transitioning their services to online platforms, learning website management and video conferencing, adopting online consulting practices, and familiarizing themselves with employment law. With limited resources, many have adapted to their vastly changed environment. Ultimately, we aim to provide meaningful support to local business owners during this challenging time to help them stay in business throughout this crisis and thrive in the days that follow. It's early morning and I feel a dry cough rising up from my lungs as well as a COVID-19 panic. But remembering my seasonal allergies and the reassuring note from my doctor that most COVID-19 cases are resolved at home with minor symptoms, I head to the bathroom where I take my vital signs. Pulse there. Temperature normal, oxygen levels high. I'll live for another day if this is what you call living. I go to the kitchen and never before has it seemed so antiseptically clean, almost like an operating room. Will I need to wear surgical gloves so as not to infect myself or others at breakfast? A friend announces he's spray cleaning all his vegetables, so I wonder if Lysol or bleach poisoning will be the next killer. I wander outside to the rear of the house by the patio. It's covered in wind-blown trash and dead leaves from the long winter, and I wonder if there's even a point in setting it all up. My two housemates come outside and ask if I need help, and I tell them yes. Michael grabs a broom and starts sweeping up the littered leaves while Dan and I start putting up the lattice. We both work on putting up the bamboo screening with a pneumatic staple gun, which he takes to with relish. 
Michael and I bring up the furniture from the basement and the patio miraculously comes to life. Then I notice outside how deadly silent everything is. Gone are the loud conversations, the quarreling lovers, the laughing teenagers, which now I sorely miss. The heartbeat of the city has stopped. Where is everyone? Have we become that afraid of the very air we breathe? In order to break the silence, I grab my boombox and put on some Frankie Valley. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. My neighbor Sal appears at the fence, smiling ear to ear. Play it, Al. Hey, are you going to put up your patio lights? I love looking down from my deck at night at your lights. I tell him, yes, Sal. I'll be putting up the lights. We bravely, or foolishly, decide to have our first barbecue of the season. So I send out a few invites. But will any dare to come? We have not seen our friends in over a month. So we hope for the best, but our expectations aren't high as fear grips the land. In the end, one brave soul courageously shows up. He brings his own folding chair, he parks it in the driveway, and of course, he's wearing a mask. We chat, and after 30 courageous minutes, he takes off without even having a bite. <laughs> So the four of us, my partner, my housemates, and I enjoy a delicious dinner in the waning light. Steaks, wine, conversation, laughter. For a brief moment, it almost feels normal. Those regular working meetings. <laughs> The types where we sat six to a table rather than six feet apart, oh, they're so early 2020. Now, in the age of coronavirus, we convene on Zoom and look at each other as if we live in the title sequence from the Brady Bunch. Oh, and here's the kicker. Although we're now meeting miles apart, we're learning more about our coworkers and bosses than we ever have before. And some of it isn't pretty. Zoom gives us unprecedented access to our colleagues' homes and habits. I was diagnosed at the age 24 with MS, muscular dystrophy. I was born and raised in Cambridge and went to high school here. I received my bachelor's degree in fashion design and merchandising, and then I decided to further my education by getting my master's degree in business. It was in um, 2009 when I first started to feel symptoms. The first thing I thought was, how long am I going to live, and would I be in a wheelchair soon? And then I began to wonder what my life was going to be like. I knew I had to stay strong and continue to do what I have to do, but, um, you know, so I started to do some research and found that eating healthy and exercise would help. I joined Weight Watchers with my cousin, and I lost over 36 pounds, and I felt great. After some time, I um, would wake up not knowing how my legs were going to feel, or what type of pain I'd be in if I leave the house. You know, I try to be careful when I walk because I don't want to fall, because if I fall, I won't be able to pick myself back up. At this point, I'm just trying to take everything day by day and stay strong. April 17th, 2020. One month into the pandemic and a quarter billion dollars in lost revenue. 15,000 jobs affected, half of the 30,000 jobs in the sector and the full weight of the impact falls on concert halls, museums, theaters, and other cultural venues. My 20-year-old granddaughter's comment when we were texting on Mother's Day, the world has become an empty husk of our old reality. Our country is being cracked open by the video and brutal killing of George Floyd. We condemn, we protest, we weep. For those of us wrapped in white privilege, now is a moment to look inward. 
to ask for guidance from our black friends, and to challenge racist actions and comments that perpetuate the disturbing inequalities in our country. I work in Cambridge, and this happened to me in one of the neighboring towns of Cambridge. I'm an African-American male and in my late 50s. My wife and I were cleaning up the house, and it's a beautiful day, so we spend some time outdoors cleaning up the yard, etc. I cut the lawn for the first time this season, and the lawn is very much like my own hair. It doesn't grow too fast, but there is a full head of grass that does develop, kind of moss-like. Odd how you start to look like your lawn as you grow older. My wife noticed that we had a coupon for a buy one, get one free pizza at a popular pizza place. The voucher expired that day, so we had to take advantage of it, she said. And I looked online and got the number of the pizza place and uh, called them up, and they were open. And the woman on the phone said that they only had curbside pickup. And, and that made sense, you know, because of the, the new normal. So I drove to the pizza shop and, but you know, get there, I didn't see anyone at the curb with my pizza and I parked directly, directly in front of the pizza place. I, I looked through the window from the curb standing next to my car, you know, and I couldn't see anyone or anything, you know. So I, I went up a little bit to the, to the big pizza shop windows and, and by the way, every decent pizza place has big windows, and I immediately saw a sign that said, all deliveries around the back. So I went to the back of the restaurant. I didn't see any place to pick up anything, you know, and I wanted that discount. I wanted the discount more than I wanted the pizza. So I was not about to give up. So I go back out front to the place place my face up against the window so I can have a good look inside. And I see a gentleman inside near, near the checkout register and he motions me inside, you know, he puts his mask on, I put my mask on, I tell him, come for a pizza that I ordered over the phone and everything and we make the exchange and, and I go outside to my waiting car, which was again parked directly in front of the pizza parlor. So I opened the passenger side door of my car, which was on the side near the sidewalk of the street. And as soon as I bent down to put the pizza down on the passenger front seat, I heard police sirens go off, police sirens. And there weren't that many people out there walking around on the streets, so I, you know, I got a little nervous. You know, I was hoping that the cars would just keep on going past me, but they did not. Two cop cars had come up upon me. One was parked directly behind my car and the other was at the driver's side. And then that same cop that was on the driver's side made a U-turn and parked directly across the street in front of me. And that cop got out of his car and then he pulled up on this old bank door, you know, just pulled up on the door. You know, I just stood there, quiet, Everybody just stood there, watched the cop pull up on the, on the bank door that, that never opened, you know. So I slowly walked to the driver's side of my car, you know, while the cop, you know, beside me, that was, you know, I looked in that car, didn't see much, and a guy across the street, that cop, kept pulling on the door, you know. I was certain that they were coming after me. I was certain that they were coming after me. I mean, the big issue here is not whether they were coming after me or not. I thought I was a dead man, but just being near a cop, I was sure that they would mistake my pizza for a weapon and, and, and shoot me and beat me to a pulp. Posted my story on Facebook, all my friends thought the same thing, that they were coming after me. I mean, I never feel safe around police officers. And he, he, the guy was just pulling on the door, you know. I, 
look, the main thing about this story is not about the pizza or anything. The, the main thing about this story is the police officers. You know, I thought that I was dead just being around a cop. I mean, I went home to eat the pizza. The pizza was all right. It wasn't that great, you know. Um, but the guy who sold it to me, he was nice. He was hospitable. He was professional. I wish I felt the same way around police officers. April 30th, 2020. The city of Cambridge appoints eight members to a new city manager's small business advisory committee to plan a safe reopening strategy for businesses in Cambridge. Members include the directors of the East Cambridge Business Association, Cambridge Office of Tourism, Harvard Square Business Association, Cambridge Chamber of Commerce, Central Square Bid, Cambridge Local First, the Kendall Square Association, and Simply Aaron's Unisex Salon. Leaving my house has become a solemn occasion. A simple weekly trip to buy groceries has become a dreaded activity, wishing to meet no one and get it over with as quickly as possible. The new normal that every encounter and every trip out of the house is fraught with hypervigilance is heartbreaking. I am fortunate that I have a job that I can work at home, so my work life has changed very little. However, that is not the case for many of my dancer friends. They are suffocating, suffocating from the ubiquitous infection rate, suffocating from the evaporation of income, suffocating from the theft of creative outlets. Hunkered down in my COVID-19 bunker, my life has become very simple. Eat, sleep, work, then go to the basement to work out. From that simplicity, I have reconsidered where I wish to put my energies in the future. I will permanently stop my massage practice. I will continue to learn how to play the piano and how to tap dance. I will stop eating out. I will take much more time fostering deeper friendships. June 26th, 2020. After hearing reports about Whole Foods workers in other states being sent home for wearing Black Lives Matter face masks, one woman, along with her co-workers, put on masks with the phrase Black Lives Matter on them. And they were told to take them off or be sent home. Seven workers walked off the job at Cambridge's River Street Whole Foods location. For several years now, I've been practicing a transcription for alto saxophone of the prelude from Bach's first cello suite. I played it from the sheet music, which is relatively simple for me. I'm a good reader of music notation, but I'm not as good at memorizing music, and this music is so subtle and well-crafted that it presented a significant challenge to me when I started before the pandemic hit to try to commit it to memory. After several abortive attempts, I gave up. But then, with social isolation in full swing, with all my spring and summer gigs canceled, and with a bit more time on my hands, I jumped back in. I committed to memorizing the 42 measures of mostly 16th notes, or about 655 notes, by the end of the summer. I'm pretty nearly there. I approached it by memorizing one measure at a time. Some measures took a few days to get under my belt, or more accurately, into my brain, and some took longer. I looked for patterns that I could absorb, and of course, did my best to memorize the sound and the flow of the brilliantly constructed piece. The final third was the hardest, with tiny alterations of patterns from measure to measure and note group to note group. But at this point, with a good amount of summer remaining, I can get through it all pretty reliably, if not totally fluently, from memory. At 
At the same time, I've also been focusing in my daily practice on the music of another genius, Charlie Parker, who followed Bach on the planet by about two centuries. I've been working on memorizing and being constantly stunned by the amazing melodies that Parker created as heads and as spontaneous improvisations on those pieces. My current effort is on the composition and Parker's solo on Dewey Square, which might have been named for Boston Square of the same name, or might have been named for the one in New York City's Staten Island. I've heard conflicting reports. Also of note, Miles Davis, who appears on the original 1947 recording, had Dewey as his middle name. A municipal parking lot behind Graffiti Alley in Central Square was turned into a center for live performances, dining, and community services, with plans to be opened by the end of July through October. And the square is intended to be programmed seven days a week for 120 days. Michael Monestein, the executive director of Central Square Bid, said that Starlight Square was an effort to boost the economy of a city that is unlikely to return to its former glory for a while. He said, we had to build something that reached the level of the crisis we're in. We have to bring our economy outside to save our livelihoods and retain our cultural district. There are days when I feel like I need to escape the world I created. My home and family, the place and people who would not exist without me, had me hiding in the bathroom these past few months just for some quality alone time. I love the people who I've been locked down with since March, and I love my house almost as much, but <laughs> there are days when I feel like I just need some time by myself. So, one day, I wandered out into the empty streets of Cambridge to contemplate how we got here. By chance, on that day, I had a reverential encounter with President Obama. I passed a local gallery displaying photos from the official White House photographer of a time that seemed so long ago. There was one photograph of President Obama that struck my heart and made me pause and look at the image of his arm outstretched and twined with a giant rainbow as if blown from his fingertip with magic. It reminded me that my purpose right now is not to give up or give in to despair, but to fight hard for our next generation. We need to fix this shit, even if we didn't make it. That's what women, mothers, and caregivers have always done. I'm committed to love. That's my power. Love, kindness, goodness, and hope don't always trump fear, hatred, anger, and despair. But if, but if I'm choosing to live in a moment to fight for the future, my moment must be grounded in love. When I turned from the photo of President Obama while on my walk, I had tears rolling down my face as I walked home with hope. September 20th, 2020. President Trump tweeted, many young Americans are being fed lies about how America is a wicked nation plagued by racism because children are being instructed from propaganda tracts like those of Howard Zinn that try to make students feel ashamed of their own history by telling the nation's history from the viewpoint of African Americans, Native Americans, women, and the working class. We're now six months into the pandemic, and I remember back to the beginning when people were afraid to touch the same paper that other people had touched, uh, mail or memos or contracts. And people debated how long it would take for the COVID to disappear off of cardboard boxes, uh, from food deliveries, or more generally from Amazon deliveries. People would leave their food deliveries on their porches in March and April so that the COVID droplets could disappear into the air or wherever. Eye contact outside, minimal at best. It's a wonder more people weren't bumping into street signs or each other as they walked around, their eyes glued to their cell phones, avoiding looking directly at one another. I remember 
conversations about just the idea of getting takeout food. Uh, never mind sitting down in a restaurant, uh, once those that had survived reopened with limited seating. I remember seeing freezer trucks in New York City with bodies awaiting cremation or burial and an endless barrage of images of the hardworking and exhausted healthcare workers crying at the end of their shifts because they couldn't go home for fear of infecting their families. And some people thought, and some still think, that the COVID was and is a hoax. Really? Oh, and, and wearing a mask is optional. Like wearing a condom, or not, because the likelihood of pregnancy is so low, right? I've learned that everyone deals with the COVID in their own way. And that many people, including me, are still scared. We will remember all of it. <laughs>